All right, if you have your Bibles, go to 2 Timothy 4.1. The title of my message is Doctrines Matter, the Nicene Creed. Raise your hand if you heard of the Nicene Creed. One, yes, two sir. people, What's two up? people. Come on, people. Not a lot of people have heard about it. <laughs> All right, so let me give you the, the background on what's happening. So in 325 A.D., Anio Domini, the year of the Lord, so just 300 years after Christ, the church was a mess. What, what I mean by that is there's some false teachings starting to creep into the church. And so Constantine, the first uh, Roman Empire emperor that became a Christian, is like, all right, he, he talked to the leaders of the church, and, and there was only one church back then, they were scattered throughout the Roman Empire and throughout the world. And so Constantine's like, come together. And so all the bishops came together. All the church leaders came together. And for weeks on end, they, they talked about the core doctrines of the Bible. And what, what, what does the Bible say? What's the, what's the main message of this book we call the Bible? Because how can we sum it up? Like, you can't read this whole book in one day. But how could I sum it up in like a, a document, in a, in a paragraph? So they come up with a paragraph to sum up what, what, we, what we believe in. And it became a prayer. Before I go there and I read it, it's actually in your bulletins, the Nassim Creed, if you can get your bulletins out. Uh, I want to read 1 Timothy 4.1. And what... Paul tells Timothy about doctrine, about having sound doctrine. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and the view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. So now Paul is giving us a charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Rebuke i got to say, that's the hardest part about being a pastor is correcting and rebuking. And that's the hardest part about being a, a Christian. This isn't just for pastors, it's for Christians. Sometimes we got to correct and rebuke. But don't forget to encourage. We all need encouragement, even your pastor. And encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For, so, verse 3, this is speaking about what was happening back then and what's happening today. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine or sound teachings. Instead, to suit their own desire, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Is that not happy in our world today? Father God, help us, Lord, to have all discernment. Help us to know right from wrong, truth from error. Because, Lord, there's a lot of false doctrines and false teachings in our world today. And you predicted, Jesus, that there'll be false prophets that will come. False teachers. So I just pray, God, that we won't be fooled when they come our way. Help us stand, stand true to your word. Amen. All right, so uh, years ago when I was working at UPS, I got tired of unloading the big trucks. I mean, it was like the hardest job I ever had because back then they didn't have no AC in those trucks. And so I had to unload like a big trailer within one hour or otherwise my supervisor would hammer me. So I got tired of uh, working as an unloader. So I applied to be a, a supervisor. I used to work with Raul actually. And so um, I'm, I'm applying to be a supervisor. I had to go through five interviews. And I got to admit, the, the last interview, I bombed. I didn't even do good. <laughs> but, but they still wanted me to be a supervisor. So there's one last thing I had to do to become a supervisor. I had to uh, go through a background check. And so I went through this background check. And then I won't ever forget, like it was yesterday, Bob Brown, the main manager of UPS, he comes up to me. He looks real serious. And... Um, he looks sad, too. He's like, I'm sorry, Jose, we can't hire you uh, to be our supervisor. 
And I was like, why? And he looks at me, he's, you know why? Drinking and driving, resisting arrest. I was like, what? I don't even drink. And, and I got really upset. I was like, that's not me. It says Jose Ochoa. I got, I got the proof here. Drinking and driving, resisting arrest. And I, I'm upset now. And Bob's like ca- trying to calm me down. And he's like, okay, why don't you go to the DMV and get a DMV printout of your driving record and come back tomorrow. And so I, I come back the next day with my driving record. And he's like, hey, Jose, I want to apologize. Uh, it's a, it was another Jose Ochoa from Woodland, California. <laughs> What I want to tell you is not everything you hear is true about you. Not everything you hear going on in the media is true. Not everything you hear on Facebook is true. Not everything you hear on Instagram is true. Not everything you see on YouTube is true. There's a lot of false teachings. There's all kinds of false beliefs out there. And so Paul's trying to communicate to Timothy, don't fall for the lies of the devil. Remember, the devil is the father of all lies. And he uses the media. He uses school grade teachers. He uses friends, even family, to to try to get us not to believe in the word of truth. And so these scholars come together and they're like, all right, what is the truth? And so this is the truth, the Nicene Creed. And they met in modern day Turkey, a place called Nicaea. This is where they came up with this document called the Nicene Creed. And I read the whole creed, and everything I read is sound, except for one line. I think they could have did a better job. I'll get into that later. But here we read, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is seen and unseen. You guys remember the Pledge of Allegiance growing up? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to which the Republic stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. And I, thank you. I used to think it said invisible. It's indivisible, which means God can't be separated. You can't separate God. He's indivisible. Not invisible, but he is also invisible too, right? You can't see him with the naked eye. But you can see him through Jesus Christ. You can see him through the love of the church. You can see them. You can see God through you, through your actions and through your words. Amen. And so, one day, uh, a Bible scholar came up to Jesus and says, "Jesus, what's the greatest command of them all?" And what did Jesus says? What did the Lord say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. See, even Jesus declared God is one. And he also says in John 10, 30, I and the Father are what? One. one. Colossians 1, 16, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Paul speaking about Jesus here. I remember in high school, I had a great teacher. You guys remember your high school days? Anybody remember being in high school? I don't miss it. <laughs> but I do miss my teacher, Mr. Chu. Mr. Chu was my favorite teacher. He was my science teacher. I had so much respect for him. And he might have been the most smartest person I ever met in my life. I remember one time I got caught cheating in his class and he comes up to me and he's, he takes the paper from my hand and most teachers are like, oh, the, the, you know, throw in the trash and give you an F. Not Mr. Chu. He takes the paper from my hand and he's like, Jose, you're better than that. You're better than that. And so he allowed me to retake the test. He was a great teacher. I remember one time after class, I go, hey, Mr. Chu, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah, do you believe in God? And he goes, oh, Jose, very good question. <laughs> Without God, there'll be no science, because behind God is science. I was like, ooh, that was deep. I, I couldn't wrap my mind around that at the time. But what he was saying that because of God, there is science. 
And so and Mr. Chu used to go to my basketball games and watch me play basketball. He was a great teacher, and, but he knew as a science teacher that everything that we see in this world is because of God. Without God, there would be no science. And so here we read in this creed that God created everything that we see in the, in the seen and unseen world. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light. Just as it's impossible to separate light from light, it's impossible to separate God from God. It's impossible to separate Jesus from the Father. Wrap your mind around that. True God from true God, begot not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for the sal for our salvation. See, Jesus purchased our salvation on a wooden cross. I don't, the cross was probably a little bit bigger than that one. But Jesus died on the cross. Why? To rescue us from our sins. Because all of us, one day, we're, we're going to have to pay up for our, our sins. Even me, I was going to have to pay up for all the sins I committed. If you knew all the sins I committed, you're like, I'm never coming back to this church ever again. But... Thank God for Jesus. On the cross, he wiped away all my sins. And he wiped away all your sins too. He purchased our salvation. Did you know the word Jesus means God saves? So even in Jesus' very name, Yahweh is salvation. You translate the word Jesus, it translates to Yahweh saves. So Jesus is God the second person of the Holy Trinity. We read in John 1, 4, the Word, speaking of Jesus, or God, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the, the Nicene Creed goes on to say this, He came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. So every Christmas we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. How many of you guys love Christmas? I always look forward to Christmas. But can't we celebrate Jesus throughout the year? That's what we do every Sunday. We, we celebrate uh, Jesus on Sunday because that's the day he overcame death on the third day. The first day of the week we celebrate him. We read in Matthew 1, 23, The virgin will conceive... And give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? John 3.16. Well, before I go there to John 3.16, i got to share another story about Jesus being God, being one with the Father. And so, like, uh, when I lived with my brother in West Sacramento, I had a neighbor. His name was Muhammad. Of course, he's Muslim. Good neighbor. Very friendly. Nowadays, you have some neighbors that aren't so friendly. They don't even say hi to you. <laughs> but Muhammad, he always had a smile on his face. And uh, we would talk. He was a good person, a good neighbor. So we used to talk a lot. So I'm at American River College, and I had to write a paper on Islam in America. So I asked my neighbor, I go, Muhammad, can I interview you? And he surprised me. He said, uh, how about you interview the head imam of my church, of, of my mosque? And so that kind of startled me. I was like, so I, he asked me to go on a Friday, because Friday the Muslims go to their mosque. And so I went with him. And I was a little nervous. I, I told my, my family, I said, like, hey, pray for me. I'm, go, I'm going to the mosque. And you're, and you're like, what? They're like, really? I was like, yeah, I'm going to the mosque. No, I'm not Muslim. I'm doing an interview on the, uh, uh, my friend Muhammad invited me to the mosque to interview the imam, uh, the, the head teacher. And so, uh, so I'm getting ready to walk into the mosque. It's downtown Sacramento. And everybody's taking their shoes off. They're, wearing, they're putting on their hats. And, and so I took my shoes off. I put on a hat. I was like, okay. It was like a little white hat he put on. And the kids want to play with me. I'm like, so I, I'm like, I feel torn. Should I go in the mosque or play with the kids? They're probably like, what's this Mexican doing here? I don't know what they're thinking, but they're, they, they're looking at me like, like they just want to hang out. They're so friendly. They're friendly kids. 
And so I want to play with them, but Muhammad's walking in the mosque. I'm like, all right. So I don't want to be disrespectful because what if I start playing with the kids and they get all mad at me for playing with their kids? And so I walk into the mosque and then Muhammad right away, he goes to pray to Allah. And, then, and I'm getting ready to go pray and I'll go, I'm just going to pray to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit stopped me in my tracks and says, don't you dare. Don't you mislead anybody. And so I, I stopped and I just watched the whole service. And the, the preaching was that, that long. And, and so after that was over, I, I got to talk to the head imam, the guy that just got them doing the teachings. And I was like, hey, uh, can I ask you some questions about, you know, September 11th? He's like, yeah. And I was like, uh, so uh, do you guys uh, support Osama bin Laden? And he's like, no. Osama bin Laden is no friend of Islam. Osama bin Laden bombed two buildings. Yes, that was wrong. Now America is bombing two of our countries. And so he got a little upset. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And, and so then I, I wanted to share my faith with him. And this wasn't part of the assignment, but I was like, okay, um, do you know that Jesus is the Son of God? And he looked at me, he's like, are you trying to tell me that Jesus has God's DNA? And that's what I was trying to tell him that day. That Jesus has God's DNA. He is one with God. He is God's one and only Son, begotten of the Father. Amen? Amen. The word begotten means one of a kind or only child. So, God has one child. His name is Jesus Christ. Yes, we get to, to get adopted into that kingdom, adopted into God's family. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we become children of God. And we're all part of God's creation. But the, the way we become part of God's family is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We become born again. Born not of flesh, but born of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. We read in John 15, 16. You didn't choose me, but I chose you. So often, like, I chose Jesus. No, Jesus chose you. Is that beautiful? The Nassim Creed goes on to say this. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scripture. Let's stop there with Pontius Pilate. What thoughts come to your mind when you think of that guy? Remember Pontius Pilate? He had the opportunity to set Jesus free. Yeah, he was a coward. But he cowered out. He says, he listened to the crowd. When the crowd was saying, crucify him, crucify him. He gave in to what was popular. Right. And he, he washed his hands and said, oh, you know, I'm innocent of this man's blood. Was he really innocent of the man's blood? <clears throat> He was guilty of the sin of omission. There's the sin of commission when you deliberately sin. The, the Roman soldiers that crucified him, that's the sin of commission. Or the, the Israelites or the Jews that said, you know, we want him to be crucified, not Barnabas. Because there, there was a choice that day, remember? To let Barnabas go free or Jesus go free. And they decided to crucify Jesus. But we're all guilty of the sin of omission and commission. Right? right? Mm -hmm. There's been all times where you have, God told you to do something, and you said, no, I'm not going to do it. I didn't plan on sharing this, but I'll share, I'm going to keep it real with you. So I'm living in San Francisco, I'm driving home, and I see an accident that just took place. A, a black lady is bleeding. And my heart wanted, I wanted to stop and get out and take off my shirt and help her. But my sinful nature said, no, you don't want to get your shirt all bloody. And so I drove right past her. I prayed for her, but that's not what God wanted me to do. No. God wanted me to get out of my car, take my shirt off, and stop the bleeding. I'm guilty of the sin of omission, not doing what God was telling me to do. So often God tells us to do stuff. Like God told us a church plan. We didn't want to do it, but we listened to the voice of God. Hard work church planning. What is God asking you to do? Will you listen to him? And, and the good news is, sometimes we blow it, but God still loves you. God still loves me. He, he's the God of second chances. Amen? Amen? So Pontius Pilate committed a sin that day. He, he allowed Jesus to be crucified. 
But it wasn't just Pilate that put Jesus on the cross. It was the sins of the world. Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Just vision that in your mind, that Jesus is right now sitting on the right hand of the Father. He has power and glory. He will come again in the glory to judge the living and the dead. Ooh, that's scary. And his kingdom will not end or, or will, will never end. In other words, this document saying is Jesus is coming back. Is that biblical? Yes. Jesus is coming back. If Jesus were to come back today, would you be ready? I hope you could say yes. yes. There was a, my, a time in my life I would say no. <laughs> Like, when I was a teenager, I did not want Jesus to come back. I was not ready. Even in my early 20s, I was not ready. It was until 1997, I finally surrendered my life to God. That's the only way you could be ready. You've got to surrender your life to God. And so Jesus is coming back. We read in Revelation 22, 12, Look, I'm coming soon. Who's saying that? Who's saying that? Jesus. Bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Is Jesus a liar? When he says he's coming back, he means it. We read again, the, the, the document goes on to say this. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. This is my only gripe about the Nicene Creed. I think there should have been a bigger emphasis on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to follow Jesus. The Holy Spirit helps us to repent of our sins. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to witness. It's impossible to be a, a Christian without the Holy Spirit in your life. You need the Holy Spirit's power to, to, to follow Jesus. Even the disciples needed the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so I think there should have been a little bit bigger emphasis on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. Underline the word worship here. See, we are all created to worship. We are all worshiping God today. And, but if we're not worshiping God on... On Sundays, we're going to be worshiping something. Maybe it's the NFL. Maybe we're worshiping our kids. Maybe we're worshiping sports. Maybe we're worshiping a particular rap group. I mean, we're, we're created to worship. And if we don't worship the one true God, we're going to worship ourselves something. or something. Who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, Catholic, uh, apostolic church. The word Catholic is not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. It's talking about the universal church. You can look it up. Catholic has to do with universal church. So yeah, there's maybe 20 people here today, including the kids. But we're a part of a big church. A giant church that stretches out to every nation on this planet. Is that beautiful? We're a, we're a part of one church. Yes, there's different denominations. But it wasn't like that at the beginning. There was just one church. And then eventually there, there became a split. Uh, at about 400 AD, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church split over the Nicene Creed. Of a, you heard about it. The schism, the great schism that happened. So now there's two churches. Although there's, and God's, I think, he always wanted one bride, not two. But now there's the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. And then, in the 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church started preaching false doctrines. That you could do whatever you want, just give the church some money, and you'll be forgiven of your sin. It was called indulgences. And Martin Luther, who was a, a Catholic priest, says, that's not Bible. I can't just sleep with any woman and then just give the church some money and I'm forgiven. 
We're forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. And we're called to repent of our sins, not indulge in our sins. How can we sell people indulgences? That's wrong. So the Protestant Reformation was born. So there's three branches of Christianity now, but one day there's only going to be one church. Because it was God's idea for one church, not three churches. But the church matters. We read in Matthew 16, 8. 18. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. People that say, I don't need church, you, you're not reading the Bible. Right. Jesus says that the gates of hell will not prevail over the church, the body of believers, the body of Christ. You're not called to be a Lone Ranger Christian. That's not Bible. Yes, we're supposed to have our personal relationship with Jesus throughout the week. But we're also called to be connected with other believers. Iron sharp, sharpens iron. I don't know anybody that's, that, that has strong faith that misses church every Sunday. Maybe you know someone like that. I don't. So we need to be connected to the body of Christ. Did you know the word church is written 77 times in the New Testament? See, the word church is in there for a reason. And here's the definition of the word church. A gathering of citizens called out from their homes and to some pu public place. A assembly. Let me read that again. The definition of a church. A gathering of citizens called out from their homes and to some public place. A assembly. See, back in those days, people would leave their houses to hear... The great philosophers like Plato speak. Yes, people leave their houses and listen to a philosopher speak about life. How more important is it important to leave our houses to hear the pastor preach about the word of life, about Jesus Christ? And, and we have other people that preach, not just me. Max is going to be preaching for me next Sunday. Hallelujah. And then again, uh, the politicians... In, in Jesus' day, they would attract a big crowd and they'll talk about how life should be. And people will leave their homes and listen to the politicians speak. But now, Jesus is starting this new movement where a group of believers come together to worship God as one body of believers. And so, the word bride in the Christ is, uh, bride of Christ is written at least seven times. And then we read about the body of believers. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of one of you have, has her part, or his part. So we're all part of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. So it would be kind of, I was thinking about this morning, like, how long would my arm last if I just chopped it off? And I just came to church without my arm. Uh, obviously, I probably have only like within an hour to get it sewn back together. Otherwise, I'll lose my arm. Or if it got chopped off, it, there might not be a way of saving it. See, if we try to live outside the body of believers, there's only a matter of time before we spiritually die. We need each other. I need you. You need me. We read in Revelation 19.9, And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Speaking about the church. How we're married to Christ. So we have a covenant. We, we, like I, I made a covenant with my wife. That I'll be faithful to her. When you accept Jesus as your, as your personal Lord and Savior. You make a covenant with God. You're like I'm going to be with you for life. And that means you're being with him on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, Sundays. But you're also coming together as a group of believers. We, we all need each other. We need a worship leader. But we need greeters. We, we need someone to count out the offering after church. Yes, the, we read about giving in the Bible. How, how we're supposed to give our first fruits to God. Paul goes on to say this. In Hebrews 10.25. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. Was Paul talking to modern day church? Yep. 
It sounds like he's talking to every single church, because this happens everywhere. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the, the Lord, his return, is drawing near. So that's one reason why we need to come together, because Jesus is coming back. We need to be prepared mentally and spiritually for the second coming. So we come to church, we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we, we pray, we, we worship together, uh, we hear God's word proclaimed out loud publicly. You know, we need to study our Bible, of course, but there's something spiritual that happens when you hear the God's, God's word spoken publicly. Uh, my prayer is this, like when, the, when the apostles used to preach, the Holy Spirit used to fall on people. I'm not sure if that's happening to you right now, but my prayer is when I, when I preach, the Holy Spirit will fall upon every person that hears God's word. Lastly, we read in this document, we acknowledge one baptism. Have you been baptized? Je Jesus says that we're all supposed to be baptized and then baptize others. Go preach the good news to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So we're all called to uh, make disciples. We're all called to baptize people and be baptized. It's just not the pastor's job. It's, it's all of our jobs to do this together. Who look for the resurrection of the dead. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. There's a better world coming. Guys, girls, there's a better world. God's kingdom is coming soon. And the Nicene Creed ends with an amen. How we are to make this our prayer. So inside your bulletin is a Nicene Creed. I want to give you a homework assignment. Before you go to bed, read that. Make that your prayer before you go to bed tonight. We're going we're to close in worship now. Last thing I want to say about this creed, it says we. But what I want you to do tonight is say I. Make it personal. Did you guys see that document? I'm going to read it one more time. Could we stand? We're going to make this our prayer. I believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternal begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made for us, and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnated of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who, the, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We, I, believe in one, universal, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.